So welcome everyone to your 2021 Dropshipping Blueprint with four of the founding council members of the Dropshipping Council. I'm super excited to have this panel back together after how well our Q4 Dropshipping Blueprint was, was received uh, late last year. Um, it's great to have you guys back on. So, so uh, today we'll be focusing on uh, and, and evaluating how Q4 2020 went for each of us and also what you guys need to be doing as the audience to get your dropshipping business um, on the road to the fast track in 2021. Um, as a brief intro, if you don't know what the Dropshipping Council is, it's an exclusive invite-only mastermind community of pre-qualified dropshippers that have hit at least 100K per month in sales. Um, and the council members get to network with other high-level dropshippers, um, kind of like the panelists that you see on here, uh, through a dedicated Slack community. They also access privately held masterclasses and they get access to exclusive discounts with major partners like SMS Bump, Recart, and Debutify. Um, so head over to the dropshippingcouncil.com to see if you qualify. Um, now let's do a quick round of introduction before we get going. Um, so again, very excited to have with us today, Peter Pru, who is a two-time Two Comma Club Award winner, and he's also the founder of e-commerce Empire Builders. Um, super pumped to have Camille Sitar on board, also known as the e-com king. Uh, he's one of the most respected dropshippers in the space on YouTube. Uh, and also Ricky Hayes. Ricky Hayes is the co-founder of Debutify, uh, and that's one of the most popular Shopify themes for his stores. And he's also built multiple six and seven figure e-com stores. Um, and finally, my name is Shushir Nigam, and I'm the founder of the Dropshipping Council. And I also run my own e-com stores that have exceeded seven figures in sales, along with our YouTube channel, Journey to Freedom. Um, and what we'll make sure is you'll find the link to each of our YouTube channels uh, in the video description as well as to the Dropshipping Council. So again, very excited to dive into the questions now uh, so we can help our audience make 2021 their most successful year yet. So let's start off with uh, a bit of a postmortem about uh, on, on Q4 of last year. Uh, running into Q4, this was really uh, built up and hyped up to be the biggest ever Q4 because of COVID, because of the rise of e-commerce. Um, do you guys think BFCM and Q4 in general, did it live up to its hype? How did each of you kind of do during that phase in Q4 last year? Yeah, so I think I'll go first. Um, this Q4, well, last Q4, I made a video about it on my YouTube channel and I show the day of my life doing Q4 and we did around about $480,000 in the end just during that during that time. Um, it, did, it, it, it was good, but uh, although it was the best time ever to, to do it, I actually scaled like down by at least maybe almost almost just over a half. I scaled down. Um, we could have done at least seven figures, but due to the shipping times and the supply issues, mm -hmm. I did not want to risk any like crazy chargeback. So I actually made less in revenue this year, but I was actually five percent more profitable this year, which is insane. So. That was pretty much what I chose to do this year. Well, last year, sorry. That's great. How about you guys? So yeah, for for me, it was quite the adjustment. This the the last time we we talked. You know, my 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 daughter was born in uh, uh, late July, uh, which was a big adjustment. Obviously, at that point, you're really planning a lot of this stuff out. And so my big focus has been, you know, just hiring a lot of people, just like teams, building out proper SOPs, like, and really for me, it was making sure that stuff can operate without me. You know, we've had some problems, you know, we, we drop ship a lot of uh, supplements primarily, you know, very high margin, which is great. But, you know, we did end up actually selling out of our supplement, which is, which is awesome. But we had a order for 10,000 units supposed to be ready to go uh, to like in order, like around the Christmas time, because we sold out around uh, uh, on Black Friday. Mm -hmm. um, but COVID like completely, you know, I don't know if you guys have done anything with supplements before, but there's been a lot of delays uh, for some of the ingredients um, mm -hmm. and, and the co-packers and stuff like that. Uh, we just drop ship them. So our manufacturer essentially creates our supplement for us and then also stores and ships them for us as well. Uh, so we've been dealing with, with kind of like that logistical nightmare uh, a little bit. Um, but really, you know, 
we've also, I don't know, I know you, you have some great questions here lined up. Our big thing has also been, and I don't know if you guys have seen this more so than past years, is the refund rates have been higher, at least in, you know, even on, on our client businesses that, that we kind of help with. Um, we've just seen like, and that, that's been, you know, it, it's like the revenue increase, but like, like a little bit of the complaining and the refund mm -hmm. rates, like after the fact has gone up a little bit. So I almost want to say like, yeah, the hype was there, but like there was like a little bit more headaches with it as well. So. Right. How about you? Yeah. Um, similar, similar for me, uh, um, you know, in terms of that, so I, uh, similar to Peter and uh, Camille, I use a warehouse myself, um, my own warehouse and that. And the problem that I had was that COVID just caused massive delays in terms of the actual orders being even shipped. <laughs> and then, then at uh, border control, it took like two weeks just for the order. <laughs> so I, my, re my revenue was nowhere near as high. And um, I took the perspective of, uh, Peter and Camille as well that I didn't really want to scale as high as well because um, my shipping times were really fast because I could get them into the warehouse but my problem was is that getting the product to the warehouse was the entire problem um, so for me I wasn't able I scaled pretty comfortably up to about the 16th of December then I pretty much just had to stop because uh, pretty much just ran out of stock and so um, my revenue was nowhere near as high as I wanted it to be was only on this latest store hitting about 7k a day um, and wanted to scale far higher but wasn't able to just simply because of COVID restrictions and stuff as well so I just didn't want to get like what uh, Peter said chargebacks and refunds nothing worse honestly and um, even though planned ahead for that still got some straight after Christmas I don't know about you guys but Dude, man, it's crazy I don't know what it is I've never and like being honest, like, you know, you have to deal with charge racks refunds. It's like, we're still dealing with that mm -hmm. now. Like it's yeah, more so than ever. So last fun. month, last month, I had more refunds and chargebacks than literally in like two years combined. Wow. Right. Like it, it was, it was, I don't, again, it could have just been, you know, some stuff with, with our, with our process, but like, it, it just seemed really high. Right. But no, the reason, the reason for that, I actually got on a phone with a stripe rep the other day. Not another day, about about a week after January, and they basically said that the reason why the chargebacks are high is because people are trying to get money back to help them during COVID. So yeah. they're saying that that's a massive issue that they've had very recently. So yeah, maybe just people trying to yeah, try so try too. things on, right? Um, Rick, your camera's green, but we can hear you fine. So I think it's okay. Yeah, it's a pain uh, in the butt. And oh, like, honestly, if you do with charge racks, we're we're actually hiring this company. Anybody that's listening might want to work with them. They will because it's it's a pain in the butt if you actually deal with these chargebacks and stuff yourself. It's mm -hmm. called Chargebacks Nine One One. I don't know if you guys have experience with them. They're they're somebody we're going to be working with, and they will handle like all that kind of stuff for you. Yeah, I'm not affiliated with them at all. Like I said, yeah. just a resource we're using. Mm -hmm. no, I'm, I, I'm obviously hearing a theme, right? Like the Q4, I think even for me was not as good or, or as huge as it was, I think in 2019, um, you know, I, I've, I've been holding my inventory through uh, SFN, Shopify fulfillment networks in, in the U S the same thing, the stock that was there. Yeah. They delivered that very quickly, you know, three to five business days, but getting stock to the warehouse. Uh, just, you know, stuff getting stuck on the border and, and taking weeks longer than expected. So stuff which I was expecting to arrive in time for BFCM didn't show up until mid-December. So you, you kind of miss the boat on that. Uh, so, you know, some of the inventory that gets uh, carried over, still trying to work through that <laughs> in January. So, but yeah, it's, it's, in, it's, it's learning, I think, uh, through, throughout the Q4. Every Q4 bring its, brings its own learning experiences along the way. Um, so what are you guys planning to do differently, uh, this year? So 2021 looking forward, what are you guys doing differently this year compared to 2020? You know, anyway. for, yeah, so, so for us, it's, you know, this is something we've been always focused on, but more so heavily. It was actually interesting. It was like our last conversation we were talking about, like phone, SMS, text messaging and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And just like really, you know, you, you see all these privacy concerns and, and I'm sure we'll get into that more so, but I think this is going to encourage more people to like really like focus on building stuff that you control 
you know, like social media is great. It's an asset, you know, but still, do you really control, like we lost an Instagram account for like two weeks and for like no reason. And finally, you know, so is it an asset? Like yeah. kind of, but you know, like, you know, emails, phone numbers, putting like massive effort into that. Right. These are things that, you know, you really control. So that's that, you know, going into 2021, that's going to be a, a big thing. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed just coming, kind of going back to Q4 of last year, um, in comparison to the years before, I've somehow found the effectiveness of text marketing to be a lot lower. I don't know why or how, but the same things that got me amazing results in 2019 um, didn't do much at all in Q4 last year for text marketing. And, you know, one clue that I got from some, some of the other friends I have was even text messages now kind of have a spam folder. Uh, so many of your text messages carriers right Correct. so 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 here's the thing like we use twilio so you can use we use a couple different platforms but twilio if you, you like use it with active campaign that's kind of how we we integrate it mm -hmm. it's kind of a one-way kind of communication so when they reply back you kind of need to use zapier and then like we send it to right. a slack channel where all the replies go mm -hmm. but they can't you can't like text them back right like yeah. with a support so mm -hmm. if you get flagged by these carriers right mm -hmm that's what's going to happen. That actually happened to us. And we ended up having to get new phone numbers that you can get with Twilio. They're like a dollar a yeah, month. Yeah. And then you could send out those, those broadcasts again. Mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily know the best way to go about that with the filters. I think, you know, we work with someone that really helps us manage this. It's just about lowering the volume of yeah, it, yeah. Don't, like try and blast 20,000 texts in, in a, you know, a day, try to stripe it over a week. So that's, that's what mm -hmm. we're doing. Yeah. How about you? Do you guys uh, break in? It's also... Yeah. Yeah. For, sorry if my camera, by the way, if I can. But anyway, but um, uh, for me, it's also, I think that very strongly that SMS marketing is becoming saturated, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. like, like any channel, it's becoming pretty saturated. And um, like, for instance, I'm getting text messages from Australian companies like Domino's <laughs> every day and stuff. And uh, text messaging has become the, a very popular channel and right. I think it is becoming a crowded space. Mm -hmm. um, but back to your question about what I plan to do for yes. 2021. Is, for me, I'm just very focused on a slow, steady burn for me that um, in terms of all I'm focused on is my LTV right now. I see that LTV is just always, always been my focus, but tenfold mm -hmm. more this year because the rising cost of uh, of Facebook, of Google, the competition, we really have to, and, and it pretty much ties into what Peter said, where um, I'm very heavily focused on copy, landing pages, and email marketing for me. People mm -hmm. say email marketing very saturated, but once you tap into email marketing, in my opinion, it just, it's just a constant stream of just great cash that's pretty much just pure income. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, my big focus is about just getting getting the lists like Peter and nurturing them nothing more than that because the I agree entirely with you Peter that like you know you can't trust Google you can't trust Facebook and that with tightening policies and and tightening uh, government putting new mandates and stuff in we have to very much look at the long-term burn in my opinion so I prefer uh, that's sort of my focus even if that means that I don't scale as aggressively i, I want to see more stability and control in my business so that's yeah. that's my focus yeah consistency i think is the name of the game here <laughs> yeah consistency yeah good yeah <laughs> how about you camille yeah so with me i've got some yeah so it's quite fun how i'm doing things so the first thing that i'm doing this year um and i think i'll i think in the drop shipping community i think i'll set the pace with this which is I'm now diving very much into artificial intelligence, artificial reality, where now my websites, you can go on your mobile phone and see the product through your phone. So you go on your phone, you click a button on Shopify on the website, and then you, the product will appear through your camera. Um, now, the reason why I'm doing that is because I've come to the conclusion that in a lot of countries, especially in the UK, you can't go to shops at the moment. We're in a full lockdown and it's going to be like that for a long time uh, until the vaccine gets put out. And customers ain't going to be able to see the product they're buying because they can't go to the shop anymore. So if you're buying a product that's over the price of probably $40, you're not going to feel confident buying it unless you know what it looks like in a 3D view or in your 
house apartment. So right. I feel like for customers to be able to see the product at home where they're safe, even in the lockdown, that's going to give them more belief to go and buy it if you're tapping into the more high ticket uh, market. So we put in place at the moment that we're doing a lot of our AR on the website to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, and the AR things that we've put in place is, like I said, the, the one where it's in a white background and the product will be a 3D rotation. And then we've also got where in your building, you can also put it anywhere, like an object. Mm. Um, the next step that we're going to take, and this is going to take a little bit of time, is we're going to try and put AR into the Facebook ad section. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen really till maybe April, May time, just, just because of the way Facebook is at the moment. But then the next thing that I'm doing, that's like the biggest thing that I'm doing in like drop shipping, white labeling at the moment. Like that's the biggest thing that I'm really changing. But then the second thing is I'm also taking like a small step back out of drop shipping, slowing down on it and, and focusing more on the brands that I built, like the clothing brand that I've got, Solar Towel. There's a couple of other brands that I've got that are white labeled. I'm going to focus more on them now um, because again, I don't have issues with Facebook with them because it's a real proper big yeah. company. Um, I've got customer lifetime value. That's amazing. Uh, the profit margin, growing the asset as a company, it's going to be worth, the clothing brand will be worth probably in the next five years, at least one to five million pounds. So I'm really trying to build the brands that I've got at the moment. That's fantastic. Great to hear new stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've seen actually some brands do it like different kinds of watch companies and stuff yes. where you can like put your, your wrist out and like see it yeah. on or even like more high ticket products. I don't know if Wayfair does it or something like that. It should, mm -hmm. but where you can like, you know, kind of see like a desk in your room and stuff like that's interesting. Yeah, yeah 100%. And the reason why high tech, what the reason why high ticket companies are doing it is because it's very expensive to mm -hmm. get in the first place. Like to get 3D mapping done to a product, you're looking at a couple, three, $500. So for most beginners, they're not going to want to spend that kind of money on just getting it modeled. And then to get it put onto Shopify, you're looking at again another web developer that's going to cost you about another four five hundred dollars so it's like a thousand dollar per website so unless you've got the pockets it's it's not cheap mm -hmm. yeah. doesn't shopify support i i thought shopify support yeah they that. just they just they just added it to the to the to the code like literally a couple of months ago no maybe a couple of weeks a couple of months ago they've literally just added it it's really fascinating so i, I think it's similar to what many of the uh like eyeglass companies do, right? So the, the AI that helps you visualize, hey, you know, without going to the store, you want to see how it looks on your face. Uh, so yes, sir. pretty cool. So kind of bringing it up one level um, to look at it from, from the audience standpoint who's watching this, what kind of niches and markets uh, do you think are, are trending or will trend going forward in this, this year in 2021? Yeah, so I think a lot of trends for me. Um, personally, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm diving a lot into digital products um, because they, because a lot of people now have never had more time than ever to go on their phones, mm. their devices. So I'm currently selling a lot of digital products um, that, 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 that are, I don't want to give too much away because it's such an un, unsaturated niche in the, in the industry. So, but for example, let's say you, you sell like presets for photographers, you know, like presets you, they can add on top of their photos. Mm -hmm. You can buy them on websites for like a couple of dollars and then just sell them on as a digital product. So to drop ship like that, you don't need to send it to people. And because people are now bringing up new hobbies like photography, editing and working from home i feel like that is just so unsaturated and we've got we've got a store ourselves doing it at the moment and it's doing like 2k a day at the moment consistently so mm -hmm. so for me i i agree sort of camille with digital products i also just think um print on demand in general is now you know drop shipping has become a thing and now that sort of extra layer of print on demand to me i think is going to really like whenever i think of a t-shirt uh, you know, if you can get a customized T-shirt, I see a lot of those now where people get, um, I think I saw like uh, someone make an entire store around um, like the Simpsons where you can get your character as like a Simpsons character or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what an ingenious idea that is. Um, and 
Uh, I just think the whole print on demand thing, that extra layer of personalization, people are mm. just, I'm noticing people are really jumping on board. Um, so that's something that like I personally am venturing more into print on demand related products, especially for apparel that works very, very well from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you see, do you find though that's a market which is tough to differentiate yourself in though? Like apparel in terms of for print on demand? Yeah, it, it's somewhat... Well, it's, it's all like, again, about the, the design concept that you give people. Yeah. Like I've seen ones where people can get a customized dog mat, like a, a customized dog mat, uh, door mm -hmm. mat, sorry. Um, and it, it's all just about presenting it. Like what I found works really well for me when I see these ads is that you see a standard door mat and then you see the customized one mm. um, and how sort of happy people are, just a sort of a side by side. Right. Um, so I think it's more about how you present it and um, people just love it. Like, you know, I'm a dog lover. I loved it. For instance, I was nearly tempted to buy it. Anyway, and so um, I just see that extra layer because people just feel so much more connected to it. It's more emotional. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an industry that hasn't really been very heavily tapped yet. Like you look at all the, the drop shipping niches, very heavily saturated as a whole. And you look at this and it's still very unsaturated. So that, and that is for, as I said, like I'm focusing more on apparel at this stage, but mm -hmm. um, like there's plenty of different sub areas you can do as well. Like jewelry would be another fantastic one, yeah. getting inscriptions yeah. on various. Correct. I was just going to make a point that uh, a very good uh, case study that I came across recently um, that was shared by uh, Matt Connect at Sales Genomics. One of their clients, um, what they did was they did POD, um, except with custom jewelry, custom keychains. In which was basically a replica of their pets, so a keychain of your pet essentially. And they their angle was all about uh, to memorize, you know, a, a a pet that you've lost. So it really got the emotional angle into it. Um, and all the ads were all very emo emotion driving uh, ads, and they showed that copy. Oh yeah, a memory keepsake for for the one that was so close to you, kind of a thing. And they've scaled to millions of dollars over Q4. So that, that's, a, that's one very good case study to look at. How would you mm, be? Exactly. Yeah, so the, um, you know, coming back even to, with the digital products, something I talk a lot about, uh, especially mixing digital products with, with e-commerce and physical products. That's one of like, whenever I'm looking at a niche or anything, I'm basically looking at three criteria, right? evergreen right has it been around for a while is it going to be here for a while not a ton of brand loyalty and is there a lot of physical and digital products um you know a lot of drop shippers come into the space and i'm very direct response marketing you you guys probably know that right like that's how that's how we build our business we mainly use like sales funnels to do it collect emails mm -hmm. and you know uh, and all that stuff, but we've been finding a lot of success, you know, selling digital products on the backs of physical products, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like a psychological reason that it works so well. It's because of like, you know, a lot of people will try and be like, oh, well, I'll just go sell eBooks and courses, but it's not that easy to sell on the front end because it ha you're missing on that, that like Amazon effect, like it's not tangible, right? So your refund rates are typically higher on a digital product, at least from what I've seen. Right. But if you can lead in with something, you know, that's physical, maybe bundle in some ebooks or courses into that. Like we're doing this for a woodworking or the woodworking funnel, a uh, funnel right now where we're leading in with physical product, uh, bundling them some stuff to help them with the product. Right. Uh, and then upselling them into di different kinds of, uh, you know, courses or, you know, stuff. And you can you can use PLR websites uh, and stuff out there. We can get this stuff pretty cheap and then rebrand it for yourself, you know, get a designer on Fiverr to make it look pretty. Um, and it's all margin really. So if you add it as one of your like one click upsells, um, let's say you charge 29 bucks for it. It costs you, you know, 50 bucks to make it look pretty, right? Like, you know, after a few sales, right, you're, you you could really dilute that ad cost, right? And that that's big for me. Another big trend is, you know, subscription. That's another big, big thing that, you know, I, I, preach is like you, you need subscription like every business can somehow do it you just kind of have to think it through whether it's you know digital members area you know some niches you can't really do digital products as easily with or you know a subscription box business or a mixture of both so you know i i uh, that's kind of the the trends i'm seeing
Yeah, no, that's a fantastic tip. One thing I, I've done recently, I've applied a lot of what you just said, Pete. So as, I find especially for products which are a little bit complicated to use properly, uh, the, the ebook and, the, and the, the, the content that you sell afterwards as an upsell, not only does it give you margin, obviously, but it will make your customers use your product more effectively. And that's going to reduce your return rates. So it's going to, it's a, it's a huge win-win. Uh, well, this is a big thing. What people don't realize that everyone's like, oh, they forget that there's a person on the end of their transaction. Most people are like, oh, I just want to sell, make money. But it's one thing to sell somebody something, but then you have to sell them on actually using it. I'm reading actually a really good book. You guys would love it. It's called Pay to Think. It's um, it's a, kind of boring, but great read if you're trying to get into that, you know, that CEO mindset. And that, that's like a big thing that they talk about in there, right? Because if they're not using your product, like people try to combat refunds with like, you know, other in other ways, like, you know, but like, what if you just get them to use it more effectively, right? Then, mm -hmm. then your refund rate and chargebacks and all those things will naturally go down. Yeah, that's fantastic. One just tangent from what you mentioned, um, upsells. So I know Zipify, for example, has moved to, uh, you know, being a native to Shopify. And that, right now, at least it has its own set of restrictions, I believe. Uh, pay, it doesn't, you know, accept PayPal payments at the moment. I'm guessing they'll get around to it. But how are you guys dealing with that move? What do you guys use for your upsells? Um, let's talk about Shopify. I know obviously there's other platforms, but on Shopify, what do you guys use for upsells? So I, I mainly only use ClickFunnels. Any client that we have that we'll build funnels for and stuff like that, we'll just mm -hmm. port it to a Shopify backend to, to fulfill it off of. Mm -hmm. um, I personally... You can, there's other platforms out there. I've been using ClickFunnels for like six years now. You know, you get away with a lot more, right? Like at the end of the day, like Shopify is a publicly traded company. You're not going to get away with certain things. Like there's ways now to combat you know, with the tracking and things like that that's going on with, 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 with some click code you can add to your ClickFunnels pages. So I just use that and, you know, it, it, there, it doesn't take a portion of your revenue on the upsells that, that it makes you. So there's, there's mm -hmm. benefits to that. I know like some people will say it's clunky, this or that, you know, it's like anything, but you can always port those or, orders over to your yeah. Shopify store. So to me, it's just, that's what I use. So I know you guys will probably have, you know, better tips for the Shopify side. Yeah. How about you guys? What's your experience with the one click upsells? Yeah. So I actually have been trialing the one-click upsell because of the native integration, but I'll be honest, it hasn't been working as well for me because, um, and it's a bit annoying uh, that I, have you guys ever heard of Afterpay? Um, yeah. Or, um, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, buy now, pay later. Like I think there's Klarna, there's a firm. Anyway, we use Afterpay. Um, and it only has integration with Shopify, which is a royal pain in the ass because I personally am an advocate for ClickFunnels as well and I would love to use it. But a lot of our customers use Afterpay and it's mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately one click upsell doesn't have integration with that yet either, which is just right. an unfortunate reality, the same as PayPal. Yeah. Um, it still works well, but obviously it only really works when they use you know, a, a normal credit card essentially. Um, I, I've found that... Uh, it gets me about that still five ten percent on the transactions that go through as a credit card but so as a whole it's not actually generating me as much as i'd like because as i said a lot of mine are through paypal and afterpay so mm -hmm. uh, a little bit frustrating there um nonetheless so but it is a, it is a really good app and i do like how it becomes more natively integrated um very much and you know i'm looking at using click funnels and that more because it is a fantastic app like you know copy paste mm -hmm. set it up funnel, you know, I, I love the conversion rate optimization. It's just designed to make a lot of money. But yeah, that's, that's sort of, uh, that's why people hate it because it's very, it's so direct responsy and like me, <laughs> people aren't used to it. So they have like opinion, but it, like it, it converts a lot better. Like it, it just does. Cause it's more simplified, right? Yeah. Like there's not a ton of stuff going on. So I think Shopify has the play uh, has a place. I'm not saying like storefronts don't, but like cold traffic, like what's the purpose of cold traffic, right? It's to create something for you're not necessarily buying buyers, right? You're buying data, right? It's what you what you're gonna do with that data that you pull out of Facebook or YouTube or wherever, right? So, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people will be like, "Oh, nobody will ever buy a page from a page from that." But it's like sometimes you're just too in the weeds in marketing that you don't realize like the average person does buy like from these kind of sites. I mean, but it is what it is. 
I yeah, I, I agree though. Like, you know, to me, the most important thing is having a very simple, you know, focused journey for the customer and copy. You know, I, I'm a big fan of my copy. You know, it makes mm-hmm. I until like a year or two ago, I had no idea how important a headline was, like how important a headline is to pre-frame someone, for instance. Anyway, but, but sorry, back to your thing, like as I said, one click upsell for me is what I've been using. I know there's others that I've used, like um uh, reconvert. I personally haven't had mm-hmm. much success with that. If you, if I'm honest, I just for some reason have. I get like one two percent. I don't know why, just pretty poor. Yeah. Um, and then there's some others, and I, I can't fully remember which ones they are. But that's yeah, sort of my. Experience. There's a few like in into card, and not 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 all of them have made it onto the native uh, checkout. So I think only two or three of them have actually made it. Zipify being one of them. Um, but Camille, what do you use for your post purchase? Yeah, so Ricky mentioned one of them. So with our clothing brand, and we get a lot of customers that use it, is Klarma. Klarma is very, very big in the UK. Um, mm. And a large proportion of our customers will use it, and they will use a lot of it. Um, I've tried things like Shopper Pay before. They, they're, they're, it's okay. Uh, I know Ricky may have tried them before. Um, they're okay. It, it, it did help. It helped quite a lot. Um, talking about, I did use a company called Commerce HQ, um, and I sold something on there. And Commerce HQ is not Shopify; it's a different platform. Mm-hmm. But they've got their own checkout um, upsells and stuff like that, the whole fun and whatnot. Uh, I wish Shopify had that because their version of it is amazing, mm-hmm. um, and, and that was really really good. But the ones that work on the, like, the apps that work on Shopify tend not to do not tend not to do very well for me but the one on on commerce hq worked insanely well right if you ask me i don't know why shopify just don't have their yeah, own exactly one click up sell <laughs> yeah it makes no sense it makes no sense to me so yeah they just make so much more revenue <laughs> Um, that's great though, but thanks for the tip. So yeah. now next point i had here was was a chinese new year so i know many of us tend to kind of hold inventory in advance so we kind of get around that issue. But many of the viewers that are watching this may may not be at that stage yet. So in about a week's time, most of the Chinese factories will be shutting down for three to four weeks. Um, so normally, you know, in your past years or even now, how do you guys deal with, with that supply bottleneck uh, that's about to start in a few weeks? Yeah, so with um, Chinese New Year, if it... If we're doing a product that's completely drop shipped on a longer term, we'll do something called a pre-order. So we'll change the buy now button, say pre-order, and we'll have a whole pre-order terms of service page. Mm -hmm. And we'll have an email update list telling the customer up to date when the product will come in stock and when it'll be approximately delivered. If we're not doing that, then what we'll do is we'll use a supplier. So a good supplier to use is Weo. Weo are only taking three days off this year instead of uh, two weeks so use a supplier or use a u.s supplier normally because if you're using like ds's you can filter for u.s suppliers or just use like cj dropship in u.s uh film and that's what i tend to personally do mm-hmm. great tips i think there's also come from yeah, like so Spock, personally companies like spocket uh, that also again give you the u.s suppliers and europe and european suppliers sorry ricky no, you're right. Um, yeah, no, you pretty much covered all the bases there for me too. But like, as I said, the main thing that I do uh, that I always stress to everyone is make sure to say that it's on pre-order. <laughs> um, and I cannot stress how much you want to say that it's on pre-order. And like, and that, you know, we've all probably had it. Anytime you put something on pre-order, you, you put, I put it in the, the top in the in the announcement bar pre-order put it in the description pre-order i make sure they get an email that it's on pre-order you'll still get emails you will still, you'll still get email. <laughs> why is my order not arrived like, oh my god <laughs> yeah anyway but um so that's pretty much what i like i actually um just put items purely on pre-order and i'll go into overdrive to make sure that uh customers know it's on pre-order um in terms of with the suppliers again i just uh, historically, I just use CJ drop shipping if, if I'm honest, and Spocket. Um, Spocket, I find personally, I like better for the European region, but because I've more targeted the the US region, that's why I've just used CJ. Um, and that's pretty much uh, my strategy there. And I will very much, from my perspective, take the perspective of, of uh, reducing revenue during that time because I just it's only a week, in my opinion. I'd rather 
not push things high and make a nightmare in the long term for myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pete, any, any additional tips there? I think we've covered off most of the things, it seems. I think the guys pretty much covered it. I mean, it's like every year, like <laughs> this yeah. comes up. There's like, you know, the countless amounts of YouTube content already on this <laughs> and yeah, everyone freaks out. But yeah, it, the big thing over communicate, you know, a lot of times I, you know, people see this coming, like you could have sourced inventory, right? Like you could have, mm. you could have done those things like beforehand. A lot of people, you know, try and scale, right, with just AliExpress. You can, of course, but like to me, it's like you might you you want to get to the point where you're you're building a brand, right? Like something a little bit more real, like not like sticking to to AliExpress or or whatever. I know we we leverage CJ dropshipping heavily as well, but you know, over communicate with your customers, you know, and learn from it, right? Like for next year, like source start mm-hmm. branding your products if you already have winners, right? Like you're gonna create something more tangible, a sellable asset, right? Like so. Yeah, that's great. Now, one um, one obviously issue that's hitting hitting everybody um, on the Facebook community is is the iOS fourteen change, um, and how that's that's affecting advertisers and and all the implications and all the confusion that comes along with it. Um, so, in the last probably three or four weeks, we've gotten a, maybe a bit more more clarity on the exact impacts and what to do about it. But how are you guys adapting? Are you making any major changes? Are you basically status quo in terms of adapting to this uh, iOS 14 change? Yeah, so for me personally, I'm just making sure that every domain name I've got is verified now through the business manager as they as, as it is a new protocol. Um, and to be honest with you, in my opinion, from the ads that I've been running recently and since if I compare them back to last year before the change, I've not really seen that many issues. I've not really seen that many like fundamental changes. I know mm-hmm. the events that you can target are a lot more limited, but the ones that are still available are the ones that the ones that are not available. I didn't even use them anyway, really. Yeah. So personally, I've not really done that much change. Yeah, there. I I agree entirely with Camille. I read it and I'm like. This isn't going to have that much of a change. And I watched your video, Peter, as well on the iOS update. So that was good. Thank you. Anyway, and um, but, but for me, like the way I sort of interpreted it is, is that most of us, I'm sure, will probably just use the purchase event really at the end of the day. And I don't know, the way I looked at it is I, I haven't personally noticed much of a change. And if, if I look at this anyway, as even if it doesn't have much of a change, again, like Peter was touching on it earlier, um, I work on this at the basis that we are always at the mercy of these platforms. So what I always like to take the perspective of, if you ask me not to get too much off topic is diversification. So that's where like I work on a number of traffic sources so that if something goes wrong over here, that you know, my business isn't going to flop. So that's very much the perspective I take that this will, in my opinion, this iOS update from Apple and stuff, this, this stuff like this will continue happening. I reckon that something like this might happen with Samsung in the future too. And mm-hmm. so I just think it's important to not just rely on Facebook, if you ask me, just look look elsewhere as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think everyone's going to follow sweet. I, I know right now, like results wise, like doesn't seem like there's that big of an impact. I don't think we will know till it's a little bit more broad. Right. Like, you know, with with Safari and Google Chrome and like all the, you know, potential like Samsung and all these things start happening. You know, we we leverage third party tracking software. Right. That, that just sees gives you much better results anyway. Um, you could do, you know, Hyros is a big one. It's kind of expensive. Um, there's another cost effective company that we kind of partnered with. Um, it's a cap it box. I don't know the official website it might be capitbox.com, but you can essentially install code on your click funnels account. And it's like an API. So it'll still be able to track uh, a little bit more accurately. So, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot more of these things. They might be band-aid solutions in the mm-hmm. short term. They might work a little bit better. Who knows how long Facebook will allow those kind of things to, to happen. But, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you here, Ricky, obviously it's just diversification, right. On, off these platforms, bring in traffic that, that you have a little bit more control of. Yeah. I think the main thing that my, my understanding of, I, I kind of looked at a lot of content put up by uh, Dipesh Mandelia and he did a really good job of summarizing some of this impacts. And main thing is that people are not going to adopt iOS, right for iOS 14 right now. It'll take maybe six months to a year to roll out. First of all, and once that does, 
then you'll, yeah, the impacts would probably be in terms of retargeting, in terms of attribution back to Facebook, you know, just how we're, we're used to seeing 20 to 30% of our sales not show up on Facebook, it may be a larger percentage. Uh, but ultimately, if you have a good product, if you have a good creative, there's no reason why things still won't work. It's just that you got to figure out ways to attribute it better. In my opinion, that's where Google Analytics comes into play. I'm not sure about you guys, but I love that tool to death. Yeah. <laughs> Very useful. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a nerd's dream, isn't it? <laughs> it's my a, dream, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's Have a lot going on. Have you used at all, Ricky? No, I actually haven't. Like, I know of it, and obviously it's made from uh, Alex Becker, isn't it? And uh, But I, I am really looking into using that because... Um, like hats off to him it looks like an absolutely amazing tool i just haven't used it um and so i might have to have a chat with you about that one because i'm actually like quite interested if, in if you do like affiliate marketing and stuff and it, it really is it's really well done so it's expensive you know thousand okay, bucks a month you. is not cheap but it's it helps a lot mm -hmm. so I, I tried to segue a little bit into our next topic which is ad creatives um, what, how are you thinking about ad creative strategy this year? Um, what are the, any, any major changes, changes in your thought process? What kind of ad creatives are you focusing on putting out this year for, for the products that you're marketing? I'll go. <laughs> so, you know, I've always I'm come sorry, from the frame of mind. You know. Oh, no, you go, Peter. Sorry. So I always come from the frame of mind of just variation, right? The more variation you kind of put out there, you know, seeing w mm -hmm. which ones are which ones are winners, you know, um, that that's the, that's that's the biggest thing. You know, at the end of the day, right? It's 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 just a funnel, right? And I think people try and you know when you're creating new creative, whether it's image ads or video ads, or right? a lot of people try and like do everything in that ad so they buy when they get to your page but like sometimes you you have to think about it right like because it's a funnel right they, they the purpose of the ad is to stop a scroll right that's mm -hmm. that's that's the first and foremost that it has that has to happen otherwise they'll never click your site they'll never do all those other things mm -hmm. right so it's about making sure you're really focusing on the on this on stopping the scroll um, I, we've actually been having just such great results with image ads, to be honest with you. Like yeah. they, they've been really working really well for us. We, we do video ads too, of course, um, just demonstration style, but it really depends on the product, right? If it's more of like a, not like the most fun product then image ad typically suffices. But the point is, you know, get them to stop the scroll, get them to click, right? That's the purpose of an ad, right? To get them to click. And then when they land on your landing page, you know, then, you know, getting them to sell them on opting in and then selling them on order ordering right so that's kind of the frame of mind that that i've uh that i've always come from as far as creatives you know i always you know recommend you know refreshing those creatives you know almost on a monthly basis you know don't just go into facebook ads and with one piece of creative i would never I, you know bare minimum if you're just getting started with facebook at least at the very least like four right pieces of creative whether it's images or a video here too yeah that's great yeah so me personally yeah. Um, sorry, Ricky. Me personally, sure. um, like Peter said, I've, I've found that picture ads for me personally have been working really well. Carousel ads have been working extremely well, but the new catalog ads that Facebook have given out now um, have worked really, really well. The new catalog ads have worked even better than ca uh, Carousel ads for me personally in the last few weeks. Um, in terms of video content, I'm using a company, I'm not affiliated with them. I'm using a company called Bilo. Um, and that's where you send your product to one of the creators and they'll do like a video of an unboxing experience or a website review experience. So um, having those different five uh, psychology um, experiences and split testing all five of them, um, I'm finding really, really useful. Mm -hmm. yeah, What's that great. site name? It's called B-I-L-L-O. It's really, really good, man. That's what I use. It's not cheap, don't get me wrong. It's like $50 a video, but dude, by That's far, the, some of the best stuff I've seen. That's cheaper than sending it to like an influencer, typically. Yeah, dude, it's yeah. a lot cheaper and it's a lot better in terms of the, the customer support, um, the creator's expertise. It's just, it's amazing, dude. It's, if anything, it's un underpriced. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I looked them up after a last conversation, Camille, and they're they're pretty good for sure. I'll be using them more. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't remember that one, so I'm taking note. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> um, so, uh, so for me, like the same with the guys, like obviously creatives, I find um, catalog ads actually do quite well as well. Images, it's funny how I think images are working well now because so many people are doing videos you know, yep. it's sort of a funny thing and and that becomes a pattern interrupt which is a funny thing but for me i actually i look at it as well that um the reason that personally like catalog ads that does so well for me the same as like Camilla, you know, is more because of the amount of placements you can be on um because again like i i'm focused a lot more now on like you know obviously the news feeds are always going to get you the most traffic but uh, is it going to make you the most profit obviously you know and so uh, the good thing with catalog ads is they can pretty much show up anywhere um, mm -hmm. on nearly any placement. So I focus on that and it allows you to just show up on nearly any placement. And a lot of Facebook is now very focused on trying to release new placements where feasible. And so I find that that works very well for me. And they're so easy to do. It's pretty much you just integrate your catalog and you just literally run an ad. It like takes no time. You just do the targeting and it does the work for you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, so that's sort of one of the things. And like, I try and cycle my creatives, especially for a winning product, probably yeah, once a fortnight where at least one to two new uh, variations of an existing winning product, uh, creative, sorry, that I use and repeat that cycle. It's pretty much mm -hmm. how I do it. That's great. Great tips, guys. But so come here, I to drop off, but we're talking about Facebook ad strategies. Um, how are you guys uh, adapting or evolving um, your testing or your scaling strategies on Facebook you know, the debate between CBOs and ABOs. What's, what's your take on that for 2021? Um, yeah, so for me, if I'm honest, I haven't found, if, from my perspective anyway, I haven't found a clear differentiator between the two. Mm -hmm. I've just stuck to CBO, if I'm perfectly honest. Yeah. I see that ABO is very good for starting out, in my opinion, from what I found. But I, I find that CBO gets its feet after just a bit longer. And I find that it, it just makes the scaling process a bit easier longer term mm -hmm. um, so i generally just stick with cbo it might be a little bit more painful up front um, i found at times but i always find over time it well from my perspective that i found that it generally stabilizes and does better than abo mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much and i've just decided to take perspective of look both strategies work abo or cbo and i've just decided to stick to to cbo just to be consistent with my marketing otherwise i'll just confuse myself so right. like my my recommendation to anyone is, is that just either go full ABO if you ask me or full CBO. I, that's my perspective anyway mm -hmm. on that topic. Yeah. It's interesting. Like whenever we launch like new stuff, like I'm not very involved in the day-to-day -day of actually running the ads anymore, but just from when I go in there regularly, we've always like on new stuff that we're testing, it's always the ad set budget stuff has always worked better for, for some mm -hmm. reason. Like, so um we've 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 stuck with with that um so that that's kind of where where we've been you know for for us into 2021 it's not necessarily just focusing so much scaling the facebook side but it's going into these different platforms as well that aren't like like everyone thinks it has to be facebook right it, like it, there's so many other places to get mm -hmm. traffic from that you wouldn't even think of right like like it, it, crazy ones like bing like aol like snapchat TikTok, right like there's so yeah. many places that that you can you can get traffic from so we're really focusing on the omnipresence sort of a, a approach you know in, in 2021 mm -hmm. um but i still think facebook is a great starting point for 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 anybody yeah no i i agree with you guys completely so this is kind of on the cbo abo topic i like you said ricky i tend to start out as with abos for my testing and then migrate stuff to the CBO for scaling. Um, and then if I really want to max an audience out, then I'll just have five copies of the same audience in one CBO and just burn it out uh, before moving on to something else. Um, but like you said, Pete, I, I've really focused a lot on testing new platforms. So I've been trying to run native ads. I've been trying to run Twitter ads. Um, again, different degrees of success. Twitter ads was surprisingly quite a big failure uh, for, for econ products. It's probably got to do with the niche, obviously. Uh, but native ads, you know, they, they do drive a lot of traffic. Uh, it just matters. It, it depends on the quality, obviously, and, and whether you're attracting the right people, but they drive a lot of traffic. 
if I'm if I'm perfectly honest, like um, I'm the same with Peter here that like I, and self like that omnipresent approach. And one, I just enjoy it because mm. Facebook gets to a point if you ask me, where it comes a bit repetitive and mundane. But anyway, mm. anyway, and so, <laughs> but one thing I um, I'm actually moving more towards is. Um, like what Peter said, you know, I use Bing, there's Taboola, um, Outbrain. These won't get you sales for me. I find I don't get many sales on the front end with cold traffic ads, but I find Facebook is incredibly good for remarketing. So I'm actually using more Facebook um, for a lot more remarketing focus than a lot mm -hmm. more cold traffic, it, just from what I found. Because like, for instance, with Taboola, I can get clicks for like six cents like you know although it and as long as i'm optimizing for conversions that works really well and facebook is where nearly everyone ends up and so mm. facebook does really incredibly well for remarketing so like um i i still use it for cold but i'm trying to use facebook more for uh, remarketing long term because i find that's where facebook really really shows its colors if you ask me right that's fantastic anything to add to that pete yeah, and I mean, not even as far as Facebook, just even like other traffic sources. I think a, a lot of people don't leverage like JVs, affiliates. Like if yeah. you have the margin in your product, right? Like you should be, you know, actively trying to get affiliates to promote it, whether it's, you know, go put it on ClickBank, right? Like reaching out to, you know, uh, influencers in your niche on YouTube or whatever, right? That's such an untapped source because it takes a little bit more time because you have to be like, a human right and like actually build a relationship with somebody and nobody wants to do like not a lot of people want to do that right mm -hmm. um but like that's a, that's a huge thing imagine you know like a lot of people are like oh well how do i get to you know a seven figure month and i come from the mentality it's a lot easier to make a lot of money in a small period of time than it is you know in a long period of time and the reason for that it comes down to the strategy right that that you come up with right imagine finding somebody that has you know 200,000 people on an email list or, or something like that, that you can then partner up with. Yes, they might get, you know, 30, 40% commissions on your product, right? Depending on whatever you're, you're selling, but like you can, that's how you can have a, a million dollar a day, like pretty, pretty quickly. So just changing the, the frame of mind, we're putting a lot of focus on that, you know, this year, you know, our supplements on, on ClickBank as well. Mm -hmm. So we're really focusing on like getting more affiliates on board and, and, and things like that. You know, I've just found they already have like the hardest part of this whole game is warm traffic, right? That's like the hardest thing, right? Like, so, you know, I think there's, you know, a lot of people under, it's underrated, right? For sure. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree, Tyler. Like I'm pushing hard for, I haven't used ClickBank. Um, I might have to pick your brain on that too, but like the, um, I'm using one, a similar one called Impact. Mm -hmm. um, and um, like I, I found it's, it's fantastic. Like the, the thing is, if I have to give an affiliate 30, 40%, like that's essentially my marketing cost of yep. what it'll be with Facebook mm -hmm. anyway. And it's more consistent. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do is I can easily outsource that work to one of my staff. And it's, it, it, you don't have to worry about the inconsistencies of Facebook. It's like, cause these people are just absolute experts. Like these people know how to nurture a list beyond comprehension. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> These people have been doing it so long. They just know how to get their audience to buy like nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, sorry, go ahead. There's like a, like, I think this will help you is like, you have to make it really easy for them and be yeah. like integrated, yeah. right? Don't just look for that one promotion. Like, cause we have like people that we affiliate stuff for and they're like super smart with it. I'm like taking the ideas that what they've made me do uh, for them, right? So like, for example, like integrate with their current systems that they have, right? So whether it's like a, a backend email automation that you just put in, right for them be like hey we'll write the emails we'll do everything and just all you have to do is you know stick this on the back end of your stuff and you're just making commissions mm -hmm. right off of that um we do that for a few partners that, that that we work with and it's 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 genius right because think about that's now it's not like oh there's a launch that's happening but now you're integrated into somebody else's business and you're getting that exposure so you can either like jv it or they could just yeah. be an affiliate it's, it's kind of like it brings it brings to mind a shine on so shine on there's a print on demand jewelry and they do a fantastic job of of uh, using affiliates obviously uh to to and they give you all the materials that the plug and play kind of a concept you know take it use the creatives drop it into your ads and and run with it kind of a thing so i think shine on is a great example it's got to be easy that's that. something that affiliates are lazy 
JVs are, are lazy and they're not going to go and do hard work for you because they don't care about your business as much as you do. But if you literally do all of it for them, right? Like, and just make no excuse for it. And like, really, because at the end of the day, they really just mainly care about money. Most of them, like, if you just make it like a no brainer, like, hey, we'll create everything for it. You will write in your voice, like all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Then yeah, that, that, that then it's a no brainer for them. Yeah, I mean, like to be fair to the affiliates, like in that, all they, they all they care about is money. I can say that probably to me. All I care about is the money too. So <laughs> I'm not gonna. Um, but like, um, but um, I just wanted to quickly ask. Sorry, what's everyone's experience been with TikTok in terms of ads and influences? I personally have not had much success, but I'm just actually curious on other people's experiences. So I haven't used them. I have a TikTok for like my personal brand there. And it's, it's crazy. Like we get a ton of great traffic for like, you know, our digital products, e-commerce empire builders, you know, for, for untapped, we, we do have a TikTok on there as well. We just haven't necessarily cracked the code because the thing about TikTok is it has to be like a very sexy hook. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like kind of hard to make a supplement very sexy about it. So it's like, it's a little bit easier, right. When you show like results and all this nonsense, like with personal brand, like it stops it. So we've grown really, really pretty big on, on TikTok there, but it's actually a really good source of traffic uh, for us. And, and, you know, we're, we're trying to crack the code um, with our untapped supplement where we have like a plan to do like motivational videos and, and, and stuff like that to try and get them to, to stop. Um, I haven't done any TikTok influencers. I know there's people that have success with them. I haven't, I haven't tried it yet personally but i think there's i think it's an untapped uh untapped market like anybody yeah. can go on there man like it can change your business like if you go viral like whatever it, it's it's definitely an interesting platform mm-hmm. i think it's a very niche specific thing right if you have products that resonate with that age group uh with the I don't market even think that it's age group man i think i think people on there like even in like my stuff there's people 30 plus four into mm-hmm. their 40s on there you know, like, I don't think it's just kids. I think that there's right. a lot of, like my sister's on it and she's like, you know, like 40 almost. <laughs> so, you know, like a lot of people are using, are using, I think it's an underrated platform. I, I really, I really do. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for all the tips, guys. I think this has been a very, very good discussion as last time. Um, again, thanks to each of you for pouring your hearts out. Um, Camille had to drop off a little, little bit early. Uh, but again, if you guys are watching this, if you found some value, make sure you smash that like button. Um, comment below 2021 Blueprint. Get your questions answered. All of us will be answering questions. Um, and if you get lots of good feedback, we can do this again in a few months' time. Um, so again, thanks to all of you um, and best of luck for 2021. Thanks, guys. Take care.